thank you all for coming tonight. Um, this event is sponsored by the Demerson Conservation Commission um, at Anthes, and we're really happy to have Ken Cox here from Fish and Wildlife to talk to us. Um, before we get started, just let me tell you two of the upcoming programs. Um, uh, Transition Dummerston often sponsors events with us, and they have an event on Friday, April 22nd. Um, it's a potluck, and they're going to be talking about Dummerston Cares, and that will be in the downstairs of the church in Dummerston Center. Is that correct? All right. And then um, our next um, educational event for the Conservation Commission will be on Tuesday, April 26th. Chris Politin will be coming to talk about invasions, invasive plants and what you can do on your property. Uh, Chris came and gave a presentation last fall. It was really good, and so we're having him back this spring when it's time we can get out there when the things are starting to green up. So I'll turn it over to Ken. Thank you. Thank you. Will that, be? Uh, that will be right here. And when will that be? That will be Tuesday, the 26th of April. 7 p.m.? 7 p.m. Well, thank you all for coming out this evening. Um, as Ed mentioned, it's we're back in the winter, and so uh, I guess everybody's not in their garden doing whatever. Um, if you got your peas in already, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah. So uh, my name's Ken Cox, and I'm a fisheries biologist with the Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife. I'm uh, based out of the uh, Southern Regional Office in Springfield, Vermont. Um, been there for going on 36 years. And um, the region that I cover, uh, or actually I share with another fisheries biologist who's also out of the Springfield office, is uh, multi-county. Uh, it's southern Windsor County, all of Wyndham County, and a pretty good chunk of Bennington County. Uh, so go all the way down along the Connecticut River, along the Mass Line, and um, pick up uh, the Hudson River drainage, at least that which is in Vermont. Now, when I was, uh, well, first, uh, how many are from Dummerston here? Okay, half. So when I was asked to do this talk, I and I heard uh, Conservation Commission, I kind of gave it a little bit of a bend to be of value to the Conservation Commission. So um, just keep that in mind, but I think uh, the information I give today is equally transferable to other communities. So um, I'll get into that a little bit at the end. Uh, but I was asked to talk about fishes in the town of Dummerston. Um, not a very exciting title, Fishes of Dummerston, but I couldn't come up with anything else. So um, uh, hopefully the, uh, you know, my presentation will be more informative than what the title is sort of indicating at this point. Um, to start off, I just did a little bit of a presentation outline as to what I hope to, to cover uh, this evening. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Dummerston's surface waters, its streams, and rivers, um, lakes and ponds, town that really doesn't have anything outside of small private ponds, maybe some wetland ponds, some beaver ponds. Um, I'll talk about uh, the fishes that occur in the town, uh, about the diversity of the fishes that occur here, their distribution, and I'm going to go into a little bit of life history examples of three species. Um, You'll see as I go on to go into all of them, none of us have that much time. So uh, um, I just picked out what I thought were three interesting species. And probably two of them either have, um, well, one of them has sort of a bad rap. Uh, the other one probably very few people in the room have even heard of, although it has an interesting name. I'll talk about uh, conservation and management and some conservation strategies that I um, recommend to towns, particularly like a town planning commission or a conservation commission or whatever. And then I'll take some question and answers at the end. So, 
So the first thing is just looking at Dummerston and all the surface waters. So everything on in blue here are the surface waters. And let's see if I can do this. Can everybody see the dot? Yeah. Is it shaking? Yes. Yeah. Good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, to the east, bordering New Hampshire, and none of this is I, I particularly new information for those of you who live in Dummerston or even those of you who live in the abutting communities. But we have the Connecticut River and approximately five miles of frontage um, on the town of um, uh, Dummerston and the Connecticut River. Uh, we have the West River, which is a little over five miles flowing through um, the town, and those are probably the two largest um, aquatic habitats in the town or, or budding it. And then we have some smaller drainages, which I, for lack of a better word, I call the inland streams. And we have up here Millbrook. Is that also Clotenbrook? Well, going into Putney? Um, or not? You may have other names for them. Okay. <laughs> In fact, when I was reading the uh, uh, the town, uh, the Dummerston town plan, I saw something Furnace Brook, which means nothing to me. But uh -huh. I was hoping somebody might tell me what Furnace Brook is, or where it's at. It's, okay. So we have Mill Brook, uh, we have Canoe Brook. Uh, here is Salmon Brook, which goes up into Putney. Um, down here is a large drainage which we call Crosby Brook and that's the what it's called in the town plan. And then on the western side there's Stickney Brook uh, which comes out of Sunset Lake. Um, and then there is this stream right through here it comes in just downstream from the covered bridge follows along the uh, is it the east west road i don't know what it's called cannot find any names of it on any maps um does anybody have a name for it other than what i call it the east west brook but yes guess it's not known has, it's kind of odd that it, you have Fall uh, Fallbrook over here, which is much smaller than this one, and that obviously has uh, a name. And then there's uh, you know a few other little streams that come in here. Um, Rock River comes in just about I guess near the town line. So it's really hard to pick them out here, but uh, I think. I said there was five miles of Connecticut River, a little over five miles of West River. These inland streams, um, based on the blue line, uh, and they may extend beyond here a little bit, but there's about 80 miles of inland streams in the town of Dummerston. And then you see these little blue dots here. They're really hard to pick up, but there's to a rough count, I picked up, based on what shows up on a map, as being over a hundred small ponds. And the majority of these being just, you know, less than an acre or maybe an acre or two or something like that. Very small. They're all private ponds. Um, so that's what the town has. Unfortunately, you don't have any large lakes or that sort of thing. Um, so. <laughs> about the closest thing you have to the le to a lake is the Connecticut River, which is an impounded waterway, so it's pretty close to a lake. We're, we're really close to Sunset Lake, though, are we? Excuse me? We're really close to Sunset Lake. Though. You, Sunset Lake is right there, and there may be a little bit of mapping error, <coughs> error, but when I looked at the line, it looked like it sliced off just a little bit <laughs> there, so. <laughs> <laughs> there, you may have a little bit there, but it's not much to brag about. So, <laughs> um, so what I want to do is I'm going to talk about the fishes in Dummerston, and this equally applies to the surrounding uh, towns, but 
the fish that we have in the Connecticut River have an interesting history, and it goes back to the, the late Pleistocene epoch when um, most of North, northern North America, uh, all of Canada pretty much, and um, all of New England was covered by the Laurentide Ice Sheet, the last big ice age glacier. Uh, extended um, down to uh, Long Island. In fact, Long Island is a, a terminal moraine, so as a glacier forms and it has a huge amount of mass, it may be you know, a couple miles in thickness, and it creeps down and it scours the earth as it's going down, and it picks up material. It, 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 Soils are picked up, rocks, it grinds off bedrock, and it pushes all of this stuff. And I kind of liken it, particularly coming out of winter, although this wasn't all that severe a winter, is the guy who um, plows your driveway, and it's all evident now. <laughs> you know, you probably put some new sure pack on there last year, and he comes through through the course of the winter, piles up the snow. That's the glacier. The force of the glacier is the plow. And then when all the snow is melted, you see your driveway in a nice berm at the top. You know, I have it in mind. So that's sort of a very elementary description of a terminal moraine. So if you look at Long Island, that is a bunch of that material that was pushed down to the southern limit of that glacier. And that occurred between uh, 95,000 and 2,000 years ago that we had that ice shield that you see here covering this area. And then about um, between 15,000 and 20,000 years ago, that ice shield started to creep back. And it was creeping back because the earth was warming again, it was coming out of an ice age, and meltwater, fresh water, created the first freshwater lake to be exposed by um, this ice sheet, which was Lake Connecticut. Anybody have an idea where Lake Connecticut is, or was? It's Long Island Sound. was Lake Connecticut. It was a freshwater lake separated from the ocean. Um, at about 15,000 years ago, it again creeped north and it deposited another moraine across present day, uh, the present day Connecticut River near Rocky Hill, Connecticut, which is just south of Hartford. And as the uh, ice shield retracted north from there, it added fresh water and that fresh water was responsible for creating Lake Hitchcock, which this is Rocky Point here. There's this little New Britain spillway, which you had all that moraine material there, and over time it kind of eroded, and it eroded down to a, a bedrock outcrop, <coughs> and the water level went down until it hit that bedrock. And then for a long period, that bedrock was what was holding back the water of Lake Hitchcock. And it extended north um, beyond St. Johnsbury, mm -hmm. over 200 miles. And it was a freshwater lake that, until this moraine or dam eventually breached, was fishless. There was nothing in it. Um, all the fish that had been here in prior time, or at least the few that may have been here in prior time, or the ancestors of what we have, all ended up down in this mid-Atlantic area, down here, which we call uh, Atlantic Refugia, which was a refuge from that ice age. And those fish were down there, and when this breached, <laughs> It allowed the fish to come into Lake Connecticut, 
for the brief period of time that it was there, come up the river and start to populate the Connecticut River from what we have uh, for what we have now. Why is Lake Hitchcock long and narrow? It was confined by the Connecticut River Valley. It did go up into, uh, you'll see uh, this little thing right there. Mm -hmm. That's the West River. Mm -hmm. And some of these little things, this is the White River mm -hmm. with the three branches. Um, <coughs> this was another lake which if I was talking about Lake Champlain, you can even get e deeper into this because Lake Champlain has a fish community today, the native fish that are there. It has fish that come from the Great Lakes and fish that come from the Atlantic coastal area. And they actually got the Atlantic coastal fish got into Lake Champlain <coughs> by way of this Lake Hitchcock, Connecticut River, into this Lake Winooski, and then into the Champlain Sea, which eventually became when, our when present day. Hmm? When did the dam break? It was about 15,000 years ago. Is So um, the, the waters were contiguous. Uh, is that the assumption? Uh, you know, this how did, how probably did, was contiguous. The Lake Win uh, Winooski was probably con contiguous with the Champlain Lake. Sea. Right. And then this breached briefly. Oh. Allowing, and when I'm saying briefly, I'm talking thousands, thousands of years. So all of this stuff so it is. Was, uh, it, it, they could have come up in pulses, or they could have yes, been open. Yeah, pulses. it wasn't like a, right. you know, right. a mass swamping. It, this occurred over thousands of years. So, um, and then there's a, this other little lake here, Lake Ashwela, Lake Merrimack. You know, all of those were glacial lakes formed when it was receding. And, but when you look at the fishes that we have in the Connecticut River today, um, there are 29 what we call eastern glacial refugial fishes. That is fishes that we have in the Connecticut River now that originated from this <coughs> refuge area down here before the glacier. And were they... Did they have to be saltwater tolerant, or was there continuous fresh water? Some are saltwater tolerant. Right. Others have to have fresh water. So there's a brief window <coughs> when things were fresh. Uh huh. Interesting. And eventually, this you know this breached uh, Long Island Sound in Lake Connecticut became no more, yeah. and became marine. The other thing to, to keep in mind is the coastal area, because of all of this fresh water in the ice, wasn't the full marine habitat that we have now. It was more dilute uh, 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 salinity than sure, it is now, sure. right along the coastal area. So mm -hmm. that kind of facilitates fish to mm -hmm. be able to move. So. So I said 29, uh, oh, uh, Lake Hitchcock lasted about 3,000 years before um, it was no longer a lake, but uh, purely a river. Uh, another 25 species, so I said 29 were refugial species, another 25 species got access to the Connecticut River post-European colonization introductions. So nearly half the fish that you have in the Connecticut River Basin are originally came from somewhere else and most of those probably came from Lake Champlain. Came from Lake Champlain. How did they get here? Excuse me? How did they get here? Um, the help of people. <laughs> in a bucket, deliberate stocking by um, <coughs> fishery agencies, federal and state, back in the 1800s. I'll get a little bit into that. Uh, so these, uh, these are the fish that we have in the Connecticut River now. Um, you can see there's 
a whole variety, sea lamprey, uh, American eel, American shad, eastern silvery minnow, uh, common shiner, golden shiner, goes on down. Probably a lot of these you're not familiar with. Um, they're pretty common in the Connecticut. Um, we had Atlantic salmon. Uh, that species is considered extirpated. Um, so you see all of these, you'll see several species, I guess about four here, that are, have an asterisk. And those are species of greatest conservation need. Uh, the state uh, agency of natural resources and um, um, non-governmental agencies like the, nat uh, the Nature Conservancy and uh, uh, Audubon, wide range of, of groups uh, worked on about uh, I think maybe 10, 15 years ago on the first um, wildlife action plan which identifies for all taxa, mammals, birds, reptiles and amphibians, plants, <laughs> um, um, insects, mussels, everything that lives um, except for you know microscopic organisms um, were reviewed and they came up with species of greatest conservation need. These are species that they're not endangered, they're not threatened, some of them are rare, but they all face specific threats that put their continued existence in Vermont in some sort of jeopardy. So it, their continued existence isn't guaranteed based on what we, we see their um, populations are. Now. Yes? Oh, I was going to ask, um, are all of these fish that are here, like, just need the slow, warm water from the backs up behind the dams, or are some more accustomed to have? These here in the Connecticut River are either mostly warm water fish mm -hmm. or cool water fish. Okay. Cool water being in between cold and warm, uh, perch would be a cool water fish, white sucker would be a, you know, pretty broad temperature requirements, um, where certain species, um, perch, uh, like I said, is cool water, slimy sculpin is generally considered to be a cool water fish, Atlantic salmon when they were here, um, is a cold water fish, but it was only in the Connecticut River seasonally. So these are native species in the Connecticut River, and these are oh, okay. So these are just the natives. These like are just the, the native body, species. Uh, would not be on the list, right? Yeah. And these yellow ones are all the ones that we have in the Connecticut River now that were introduced. So what is really interesting is, from a fisherman's perspective, um, before the introductions, there wasn't a heck of a lot there to. <laughs> The fish for other than you know what people today recognize as being sport fish, um, the Connecticut River didn't support many sport fish. Um, it did um, support shad, um, Atlantic salmon when they were here, but a lot of those were lost before sport fishing really became sport fishing. Um, and the Native Americans utilized a lot of these as food which today, you know, like American eels and lamprey and stuff like that, were all, you know, considered good food uh, for the Native Americans, but by our uh, European standards, um, you know, we don't really recognize them for that. So you can see here the big game fish in the Connecticut that we have now, smallmouth, largemouth bass, walleye, Northern pike, most recently channel catfish, um, brown and rainbow trout, all introductions. Yes? Oh, I was just curious why you haven't included um, sturgeon in this. Is it because they don't come this far? That's far correct. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, probably, I mean, right now, the furthest upstream that they're located is below Turner's Falls. Um, 
and uh, there's no records of sturgeon extending into the Connecticut River up into New Hampshire and in Vermont. Now, there is some records from, I think it was either the 30s or the 40s, and if you talk to some of the, the old timers who worked at Bellows Falls Dam, there was a big to-do when a uh, sturgeon ended up on the racks at Bellows Falls Dam, and it hit the newspapers and all this stuff. But it came to be known that it actually came out of the Roxbury Hatchery, which is up by uh, Northfield, and it was in a raceway on display. And it came out of Lake Champlain. It wasn't even the, the species that would be found in the lower Connecticut River. And um, they had a flood, and it got out of the raceway and made it all the way down to Bellows Falls and met its demise on the trash rack. So, Ken, my yes. question was, these fish here are fish that you would find in, like, the main stem of the Connecticut? Yes. I'm, I haven't gotten into the tributaries yet. Or the West. Yeah, no, Which I'm just you, wondering how, you know, like, what you meant by Connecticut River. Yeah, like yeah, I'm talking about the Connecticut River, and you gave me a nice segue into the West. <laughs> <laughs> right. So if we look at the same species, um, that uh, as far as we know, these are the only ones that were probably in the uh, West River, at least that portion that goes through Dummerston. As you go further up into the headwaters, you're going to get colder water and you're going to get brook trout. That's not to say that brook trout aren't found in here, but it's not the best habitat thermally for brook trout in that portion of the, the Connecticut River that um, flows through Dummerston. What's your case? A dace? Yeah. It's a, a type of minnow. Yeah, about that. Okay. Um, so if we were, you know, things that are in the minnow group, mm -hmm. dace, dace, fall fish, uh, those are all uh, common shiner. All of these are what generally you would consider to be minnows, okay. minnow species. And then similar to what I did, um, non-native species that you, do, you can find in um, um, the West River and Dummerston now, mimic shiner, uh, brown trout, I didn't mention earlier, brown trout and rainbow trout are non-native. We consider them naturalized species in Vermont. Um, they were first introduced this, into the state um, in the late 1800s, and uh, brown trout came from Europe, and the rainbow trout came from the Pacific Slope uh, in the western United States, and were introduced as sport fish. And in large part, a lot of those introductions were made because after, when we went through that agricultural heyday of the uh, early to mid 1800s and then we had industrialization right after the Civil War a, a lot of our fish communities were really decimated by habitat impacts and fishery most fishery age state fishery agencies were created shortly after the Civil War in the 1870s and one of their prime things was to restore species to our waters that had been lost, but they did a lot of exotic introductions also. Uh, of course, brook trout are very, um, require the coldest water, so if you've got degraded habitat, they're probably not going to be quite as adaptable as brown trout and rainbow trout, which can, which can tolerate a little bit warmer water than brook trout. So no, no catfish is listed? No catfish. Well, there are now, <coughs> but historically there were not. Now, some people um, will call 
bullhead, yep. horn pout, catfish. But the true catfish, the channel catfish, um, only recently got into the Connecticut River and the best we know got there by uh, an unauthorized introduction. That's the polite way of saying it, I guess. <laughs> So they're also known as carp, are they not? Carp? Carp. No, carp is a large minnow. And they're in the, the uh, they're related, similar to um, a goldfish. And they were introduced to the Connecticut River and can be found in the lower part of the West River. Um, they like pretty degraded habitat and they came from Europe. These are the inland streams. Now, when you start to get into those small streams that I, I pointed out, you can see that the fish communities become very, very limited. And honestly, they probably reflect more of what the natural fish communities are or were in, in these streams. So you see right across the top, these species are still quite common throughout uh, the streams in uh, Dummerston, and right at the top you have brook trout across all of those inland waters. And they have very high cold water requirements, require or are not tolerant of high pollution, so they're a good indicator of streams that are in pretty good condition um, that you have you know, wild brook trout populations. Brown trout, um, they tend to be in the lower parts of the stream, a little bit cl more down in the valley. Um, in these streams, there I wouldn't call them abundant. Some streams, well, canoe and salmon are the only two that we found them in, um, enough to be, you know, in abundance to be detected with our sampling methods. Um, but they're not very common. Rainbow trout is an interesting species in the Connecticut River. In, in Wyndham County, most of the rainbow trout populations, and what I mean by populations is natural reproducing populations, are found in the bottom of the Connecticut River Valley. They don't extend very far upstream. You've got a different um, soil fertility down in the valley, and you have higher alkalinity water and rainbow trout like high alkalinity water in order to successfully reproduce. So you'll go through much of Wyndham County and you will not find, other than a stocked rainbow, it's outside of those small little streams down in the valley bottom, you will not find rainbow trout because of that restriction on their uh, ability to reproduce. And then all the other species are um, ones that you saw in the other list. Um, the one that is most common, along with um, um, brook trout, is the black nose dace. Excuse me. How do you know this? Excuse me? How do you know that brown bullhead is in salmon brook and not canoe brook? Well, it's through our sampling. We, we go in and we sample the streams and we inventory all the species that we encounter in there. And brown bullhead, I will point out, is these types of streams are not the type of habitat that brown bullhead thrive in. We found it in Salmon Brook, but it probably came out of either a, a private pond or a beaver pond or something or a wetland. That's the habitat that's more conducive to <coughs> brown bullhead. Can you say just a bit about, like, you guys go out and you spend some days? Yeah, I'm going to get to oh, it okay. if that's all right. Okay. okay. <laughs> so I'm going to get into three um, species. I, I, as I said, I can't go over all the life histories of all of them. But the first one is sea lamprey. Now, it depends where you're, you are in the state. 
uh, or in the country. So if you're um, in uh, the Lake Champlain drainage or um, the Great Lakes, uh, this species is considered uh, non-native and uh, um, invasive and damaging the fisheries. And the reason I brought this up for this town and why I think it's different is this critter has an entirely different role and impact on fish populations in the Connecticut River. So I'm speaking on behalf of sea lamprey tonight. <laughs> <laughs> They're not all bad. Okay. So, okay? So if you go away tonight, just keep it in mind that they're not all bad, and we have them coming up in the Connecticut River. Um, the run will sh start in May, and they will be coming through Vernon Ladder and uh, to some extent uh, through Bellows Falls Ladder in large numbers. They are a, a fish only, I guess, a mother lamprey could love. Um, I mean, you just look at the things. but. Um, they have a very interesting life cycle, and ecologically, they serve an important role. So this is the life cycle of the lamprey. So there is the parasitic phase, which is the, the, the stage of life that causes the problem in the Great Lakes and in Lake Champlain. And this is the adult um, that it's feeding on fish that, uh, if I'll back up just a little bit, this clever little suction mouth with all the, um, the teeth, and there's a tongue in there, right there, that's like a rasp. And this fish will attach to the side of a, uh, a prey fish, um, as you see right here, and basically it just sort of kind of licks a hole through the body cavity and feeds on blood and other um, liquid tissues uh, matter. And it, um, in the ocean, all of this takes place out at sea. So the, the lamprey that are coming back to the Connecticut River, once they enter fresh water, they stop feeding. They got one thing on their mind, and that is to get up river, successfully spawn, and after they spawn, they die, mm -hmm. similar to like Pacific salmon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we have this marine parasitic stage. They come in the fresh water. They're not feeding. Um, uh, late April to early June. Uh, here it would be more, you know, May to early June. Uh, they come into the, our rivers. Uh, they use that suction mouth to build a nest. They'll pick up stones and kind of dig a pit. Um, they'll lay their eggs in that pit. And then afterwards, um, the fish die. Uh, then the young uh, will hatch, and they immediately find a silty uh, habitat uh, the edge of the stream, sandy, silty habitat, and they'll bury themselves down into the silt. And they're a little, they don't have the teeth yet, but they have that suction like mouth uh, design. And they orient themselves so the current is going this way, and it basically acts like a funnel. And they will be feeding on microscopic organisms and detritus and stuff like that. So they're not parasitic at this stage either. And then they may live, um, exist in the river three to ten, e 10 or more years at this stage. Uh, and they're in the bottom. Um, and then um, after that period of time, whatever it is, uh, they will uh, change into a migratory form, which is, again, really not feeding in fresh water, but it will, they will migrate out of the fresh water, down the river, out into the ocean, and find a host fish, and the whole thing begins. The problem with Lake Champlain and the Great Lakes is all of this takes place in the lake. So you're getting the parasitism 
occurring on fish that are uh, important to sport fishermen, salmon, walleye, uh, lake sturgeon, all of those. So that's the problem there. In the Connecticut River, it's an open system. They're able to come in and leave. Now, I said they have an important ecological role. They are nutrient recyclers. If you think of a freshwater environment, the energy flow is downstream and it goes out into the ocean. These guys feed on the marine fish, return back to fresh water, reproduce and die, and there are a whole host of um, different types of organisms that will feed on the carcasses of lamprey. So re energy and nutrients that's been lost to the sea, lamprey as well as salmon like in the Pacific Coast is a way of bringing that back to fresh water. Where otherwise it'd just be a loss. It would not be a return. So that's ecologically the importance here. In addition, these fish are um, fed upon a variety of other um, uh, fish that live in the, uh, the Connecticut or the West River, particularly these little guys. They're in sand, so if they get dislodged and out in the open, they're sort of like little night crawlers. Um, and then these guys, when they're migrating out, will be picked off. So they're all part of the food chain and they're recyclers. Yeah. Yes? I was just you kind of touched on it. How big are the water forms? How big are we see them? And then how big are they when they're at the current This these guys here are a big one would be this, you know, the length of your index finger. And they're probably as big around as um, the filler uh, inside like a ballpoint pen, you know, inside, you know, the, the little ink thing inside. They're very, very small. Um, these guys here, you're talking about six, eight inches. They become very silvery at this point in color. Um, these are blind. Uh, these guys are pretty much like adults, but they're still not quite feeding yet until they get the fresh water. These guys here will run two, two and a half feet in length. Yeah. Like about that big. If you're on the West River and you're, you're fishing, um, you may have been a little bit startled if they're migrating. Sometimes they'll come up and they don't know the difference between your foot in a boot and a rock. And they'll come up and they'll just latch on to your... <coughs> Thing. They won't feed, they're just looking for a, a resting spot. But kind of can freak you out a little bit. <laughs> yes. Do you have any idea what, what triggers the, um, the larval phase to, go, to move into the next phase? From I mean, here? In, it, from it would be related to size and probably, you know, uh, size. This range here yeah. probably is dictated by the, the productivity of the water that they're in. If they're in a very rich environment, they're probably going to grow faster and they're going to spend less time in fresh water. Uh, if it's a more nutrient poor stream, it's going to take them longer to, to get to the right age, um, size or age. What do they feed on in, the, in their uh, maritime uh, phase? Here? Uh, yes, right. Uh, they'll feed on... Like, like striped bass? Oh, they'll feed bass. on whatever they can really, any, latch on any, any to. Any large fish? Yeah. Yeah. Cod, haddock. Sure. Uh -huh. um, bluefish. Mm -hmm. uh, not just sport fish or commercial sure. fish, but any, you know, virtually anything they can get on. Which makes their impact on fisheries less because they've got a much broader... Yeah. Um, spectrum of, of prey to feed on, where in Lake Champlain, you know, it's dominated by a lot of sport fish, at least the bigger ones, and they're going to be the target. I realize they're ugly. Are they edible? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are. Um, they are um, a delicacy in Europe. Um, 
There is, in colonial days, in the Merrimack, they were called, uh, well, Manchester, New Hampshire, before it became Manchester, New Hampshire, was called Dairy Field. And they were called Dairy Field Beef. <laughs> I don't know, you know. So, um, I mean, our settlers were, you know, recently over from England and they brought their palate with them. Um, I will admit that I have tried to dress one out and no. Oh, thanks. <laughs> What's their range? Uh, they're up and down the, uh, um, the the Atlantic coast, and they're also found on the, the European side. They're pretty broad. Okay, so like all up and down all the east yeah, coast and north? Pretty north much, area? yeah. Okay, pretty good. So now we come to this guy, which all of you are familiar with. And per my personal favorite, you know, this is the gem of Vermont, you know, in terms of trout. They don't typically get very big, but every youth angler cut his teeth on these these things. They're easy to catch. They're beautiful. And they're darn good to eat. So, um, the brook trout. And it is an indicator of good habitat and good water quality. So, um, I went over... Um, about the browns and the uh, rainbow trout, the only other trout species that is native to Vermont is the lake trout. And you don't have them. Lake trout? Lake trout. Um, they like large, deep, cold water lakes. Like and in lake Michigan. Mich Michigan or Champlain or um, a lot of the lakes up in the uh, northeast kingdom of Vermont. Um, we'll have lake trout, but um, this is the one we have here. Um, and they're relatively short-lived, um, typically no more than three to four years in streams. And and they can get to maybe like five years in a, you know a lake environment that they do not compete well with other predators. So if you have a body of water that uh, um, has had northern pike introduced to it or, or bass, um, they don't thrive well. They're going to quickly uh, be preyed upon. Now, um, interesting thing about the reproduction is they're fall spawners. They spawn in late September as late as early November, but most of the spawning is probably done sometime in October. Um, they will, um, they like stream habitat, particularly with very little silt. They like a nice, clean, gravelly substrate. Um, they lay their eggs in the substrate, typically in a riffle section or at the tail of a pool. And they will um, excavate a nest, deposit the eggs in the nest. The male will pair up with the female. Um, she'll release the eggs. The eggs will be fertilized. The eggs get covered. She'll typically move upstream from that, that red. Repeat the situation. The, the, the substrate that she kicks up kind of gets washed back, covers the nest that she just did. And it's important to have fresh water go through that clean substrate to remove waste products and deliver um, well oxygenated water. So if you have heavy siltation come into a, a stream when those eggs are incubating, which is late fall through um, the winter and into the spring, uh, those eggs will be lost. Um, they'll basically suffocate. So they have very high uh, requirements, habitat requirements. So, so nearby roads are not good? Nearby roads are not good. So the gestation, it varies by temperature, um, but it, it's through the winter, and they will be um, hatching late April, early May.
at this at this latitude. Can a brook a brook trout in a you know one of the brooks around here like you know if it's only living for a few years like how how far would they like how far are they gonna move around in that stream? Is there a lot of variation to that or? <clears throat> trout will move around quite a bit when um, when spawning season comes and it's it's pretty complicated there's uh, I believe a certain amount of imprinting um, we've done studies with brown trout and they'll typically move well in the batten kill they'll move 12 miles to spawn um, and brook trout will not move that much but they're not sedentary they they will move and if they have a barrier um, that will stop them from getting up into habitat um, that they may be wanting to get into, either to reproduce or to get into a thermal refuge, cooler water, say during the summertime. So, and I'll get into those impacts in a bit. Now here's the other one that probably none of you are aware of, the tessellated darter. Um, I should have looked up what tessellated meant, and I'm sorry. I, it's uh, a couple inches to four and a half inches. It's related to a perch. Um, it's a little guy. They have interesting fins on the bottom here. Um, it's basically a bottom of fish that hugs the bottom. These little fins here, see that? Um, well, this is a fin spine right here. And they're kind of stubby. And they kind of use them as like walking sticks um, to hold down in the bottom or to move along the bottom when they're in fast water. Um, like I said, it's uh, fish size up to three inches, maximum about four and a half inches. Uh, the males live the three years and females four years. Uh, they like cool, warm, cool to warm waters, uh, including streams, large rivers, um, some lakes. Um, they prefer habitat that has little current, very little current. They, they kind of shun fast water. And um, their spawning is, is interesting in that they spawn in late spring, as most um, fish do, and the male prepares the nest. And that's, he excavates underneath a rock, and he lures the female in and she deposits the eggs, they're adhesive, so they stick on the bottom of the, the rock, so the, sort of the roof of the cave underneath there. And she takes off, and he um, incubates the eggs, fans them, and they hatch in about 21 days. Um, and what's interesting is there may be more than one male fish that cares cares for the eggs, that it's been observed that there's what they call a subdo subdominant male may assist in it. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I just think it's kind of an interest, it's an interesting little critter and it's got a nice life, life history. So conservation and management. Um, in some it's what we consider it is the protection of species at both population and genetic levels, their habitats and ecosystems from conflicts arising from human population, from a human population dominated landscape. Can you explain? I mean, yeah. The, the term population and genetic levels. Well, we used to just look at populations, just the numbers and the, the species makeup now but it's becoming increasingly more evident that the genetics of those populations are important. Those fish, um, particularly like brook trout, if you were to go out and do a genetic analysis of brook trout in different streams, you would see some variation between those. They're adapting to the particular environmental conditions of different streams. So you can't really treat them all at you know, the same, if you're going to conserve them, is that the protection of that genetic um, 
makeup of those populations is important. And that has gone into our being a little bit more thoughtful in terms of, of where we stock hatchery fish. Hatchery fish have been adapted to thrive in a hatchery. And when you introduce those into wild populations, they can genetically dilute the good stuff which can be the, at, to the detriment of of the species. Not you know, uh, it's it's just the consideration that we've gotten beyond just kind of treating all brook trout as, are the same. That there are genetic differences between them, and particularly when you're managing streams for wild populations, you want to take that in consideration. We're increasingly stocking fish because there's an angler demand in certain streams where there's a, a good wild population but we don't want to interfere with the genetics so we're creating what we call triploid fish I know it sounds like you know Frankenstein or something like that but it's basically you're you're producing fish um, that are sterile so when they when you release them into the wild, they can be caught, but they're not going to reproduce with the wild fish and pass on detrimental, you know, genetic material. So we're using that increasingly as a tool, so we're um, reducing the risk of, of having a, a negative impact. Triploid. So do you have an idea of, like, what, you know, I mean, the state of Vermont stocks a lot of, a lot of trout. Mm -hmm. Do you have an idea of what most of those most of or? our brook trout that are going into streams, where our wild populations are at, are for brook trout are triploids. Mm -hmm. Are any of the browns and rainbows? I think there's uh, rainbows. We don't stock browns um, often in streams, um, but it's kind of a complicated process how you do it. Can an angler tell the difference? No. Yeah. Yeah. So if you don't know whether to toss it back in or anything. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're edible. There's, yeah. it's. <laughs> so uh, the second um, thing is to allow for the public's use of fish populations in a manner that protects their capacity <clears throat> for self renewal. We are putting increasing effort on managing our wild populations. They're the ones that are adapted to our streams. Um, they require the least um, infrastructure and investment. If a stream can produce wild fish, all the better than, than having to um, stock um, a hatchery produced fish. So there was the question about population monitoring and how we do it. Um, for the streams like you have in Dummerston or Putney and those, our typical gear that we use is electrofishing. Um, the guy on the uh, left here is, um, is doing electrofishing. He has a backpack on that generates an electrical current. Uh, there's a cable back here, which is the negative, um, well, the uh, cathode. And he's got this wand, and you can just make out in the water there, there's a, uh, a hoop. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it generates an electrical field around this hoop. And um, it temporarily stuns the fish, makes them immobile, and what we're using excuse me, typically DC current, which actually causes the fish to kind of like get drawn in to this anode, and then they can be net, netted up, and given there's, out of view here, there's uh, one or two other people following him, and the fish are put in a bucket, and then they're processed mm -hmm. off to the side. The fish are uh, given, uh, put under with uh, anesthesia, and then they're measured for length and weight, identify species. Sometimes we take scale samples or other body parts um, to be able to age the fish. 
and that data gets crunched so we get population estimates and we can figure out the stru the age and size structure of the population which then drives our management decisions later on so that's it in a nutshell how we how we do it and this is really kind of the truth I don't know how many times I've been out on in a stream and somebody comes by who lives locally and they say there's no fish in that thing and <laughs> <laughs> up they come and do you actually tag any of the fish no okay no, no. it's just you're just them. <coughs> yeah how about bigger waters bigger waters we can use the same gear we will not use this uh, backpack but we have a larger generator that we put in a canoe or on the shore and it's just the larger generator <laughs> the canoe we can actually tow the generator with us when we're in the river if we're on the batten kill which is about 80 feet in, the, in width um, we will use three canoes three generators there's actually 15 people involved in sampling a stream that size uh, we're using smaller well a little bit bigger than than this large dip nets The other part that I want to get into is habitat protection, maintenance, and restoration. This is a big part of our, our job. Um, and to talk about habitat in the stream, this is basically a, a cross-section of the stream. And when you, the stream habitat is not limited to this water in the bowl. The habitat extends beyond the banks a certain distance, it's variable, and it also extends down into the, below the stream channel, uh, and it really extends up into the, the air. So you could take sort of a large circle around this, and that all influences the habitat that's in the stream. It's not just this little bit here between the two banks. And then this is sort of two-dimensional that I'm showing here, but then uh, it goes up and down. So it's a three-dimensional um, approach to looking at habitat. Of course, the first thing is water, and we're looking at the chemistry and the physical um, characteristics of that. What are the nutrients that are in it? Uh, um, uh, the mineral content of the water. Uh, nutrients, uh, the temperature, um, all of those things play into the water. Also the amount of water um, that will vary through the year. Um, we're talking about substrate. I kind of look, kind of use this as the furniture in the room. And fish do not like streams that are devoid of structure. They need structure, I mean, um, to find places to hide from predators, from anglers, and from um, stressful environmental um, events, like a flood. They do not like to be out in the open throughout the day. They need that structure. So as it says here, rocks, weeds, woody debris, all of that stuff is important. Then we have the riparian habitat on the side. And this is an area that we're losing a lot in our streams is as development and land use encroaches on the stream, it modifies this riparian habitat. This stuff stabilizes the banks. It is a big producer of food that becomes food for aquatic organisms. And it produces trees, which in turn, with age, become woody debris. Mm -hmm. So you're getting that becoming recruited in there. And that's very important to have that. The trees um, that overhang the, veg um, the stream channel provide shade. So it keeps cool water temperatures during the summer when water temperatures tend to um, you know, get warm. So all of that is important habitat components that um, you have to look beyond just what's between, you know, in the water and beyond. The habitat that affects the fish here 
goes to either side above. And down below here, you will have, um, there's actually water flowing through the substrate. You know, it's just not on top of the substrate. So you can get certain streams. A good example is Stickney Brook because a lot of the water that comes out of Stickney Brook is diverted for the water supply for Brattleboro. And there's a good chunk of the stream that's dewatered. But you can find little pools there that are supplied by water by this subterranean water source. And brook trout will be concentrated in these little pools that are getting cold water until you get water that comes back, you know, seasonally as you get rain events and that sort of thing. So if it wasn't for that, that stream would be in worse shape than it is. I talked about up and down the stream, that third dimension along the stream, and that's habitat connectivity or aquatic organism passage is um, the word that we use. And our impacts have been to have roads and put culverts underneath, and this is not passable to many aquatic organisms, particularly brook trout. And other organisms use it. Mink, um, different types of salamanders, crayfish, uh, other small fish have a need to move up and down streams. And when they get isolated by culvert after culvert or dams, then they cannot evade or get away from adverse conditions like hot water in the summer. So if you've got a section of stream that's exposed during the summer and their water temperature is getting up and the flows are getting low, it's going to be unsuitable for brook trout. They're going to want to go upstream to get into cooler areas. And if you've got a structure like this, it's going to prohibit them from doing that. So working with towns and um, uh, the Vermont Transportation, uh, Transportation Agency, you're seeing these old structures being replaced with fish-friendly structures where you've maintained a natural bottom here so the fish and other organisms can move up and down. Yes? Putney's putting in uh, two new culverts, which they call box culverts. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that they don't have a bottom, but they just leave the stream bottom as it is? Or what does that mean? The box culvert would be similar to this. It's rectangular, mm -hmm. but the bo it does have a bottom. This does not have a, a concrete That's what bottom. That's nice. uh, The box culvert it's designed to be oversized so the box actually goes below the stream bed and that box is filled with gravel and rocks. So you have a natural substrate inside of it. And um, does it installed according to B-Trans regulations when they're installed? Well... That make sure they're like that and not perched? They are, no, they are being required to do that now. To be compliant with current laws, you cannot block passage. Really? Yes. Okay. So, towns frequently, and I understand, you know, I live in the town of Reading and we have the same expenses that are, but the, you know, the town highway foreman uh, or the select board would want the cheapest way to get, you know, a road over a stream. And it frequently was this. Mm -hmm. But um, that's not permitted anymore. You have to, if there is a need for fish passage, now something that might, if there was right upstream here a natural obstruction like a, a waterfall or something like that, um, and there wasn't much to be gained, you might put in a structure that's not passable, that might be permitted. But in most cases, they're being putting in a structure like this or putting in a bridge. The other thing that went with these, and it, it got proven during Irene, was most of these structures were undersized. And Irene just tested them and blew out most of them. And I've seen with um, V-Trans as well as the towns is that was the, you know, 
that was a learning moment there is it pays to have a big enough culvert whether you care about the aquatic organism passage mm -hmm. don't skimp on the culvert because <laughs> mm -hmm. you're going to pay for it eventually down there uh, and then the recreational fisheries management um, you know if you're familiar with the uh, harvest regulations which are in our digest every year our stocking for uh, trout brook brown and rainbow trout is guided by this uh, statewide management plan it's a document that we all use and when we look at streams and determine whether um, it should be stocked or shouldn't be stocked or how many fish go into it um, this is the guidance that we we use it looks a little outdated. Um, it's 1993 still works <laughs> okay population threats um, all of these populations I mentioned about the species of greatest conservation need up front and um, all of those populations are faced with threats some of the species are more resilient than others but um, putting the different types of threats in categories we have habitat alteration and conversion um, this was actually done uh, right after Tropical Storm Irene mm -hmm. and it's stream channelization um, not good habitat there's very uniform um, there's no structure uh, it's wide out in the open and it's going to get hot and it's not going to be good habitat somebody put a bulldozer or a herd excavator in that oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. The Irene didn't do this this no. was this was <laughs> Um, we don't have time to go into Irene, but fish are able to adapt quite well to those events. Um, they're more adaptable than we are in those, those sorts of situations. Uh, then we other types of alterations or conversions that we have impoundments. Connecticut River, a good example. It's a big, long impoundment created by several dams. It took riverine habitat and created into slack water or an impoundment impoundment habitat and as a result you get an entirely different mix of fish species that are adaptable to that situation rather than a Connecticut River that would be free-flowing I mentioned about flow and water level manipulation um, below dams or um, in reservoirs where they uh, uh, manipulate the water levels and then sediment loading Um, a lot of these, there's a, there's a fair amount of crossover. Habitat fragmentation, this is that loss of connectivity. We have a long history in New England of creating dams. It goes back to our industrial age and our early settlement when we relied on dams to produce power and to do various tasks. Um, but they did have their impact on dicing up the habitat, the streams, into smaller sections. Uh, converting the habitat and being obstructions to fish. Same thing with culverts. Water pollution, um, various sources, chemical, nutrients, which result in oxygen, oxygen depletion. Uh, this particular um, slide here is, believe it or not, from Dummerston. And it was a pond. Um, that had livestock that had free access to the pond to get water and with livestock comes nutrients of various types that um, created a pretty nasty situation in there so that's its form of uh, pollution and if all of you have uh, followed the news for Lake Champlain the state's new initiative of um, reducing uh, agricultural sources of pollution from Missisquoi Bay that's getting at this suspended matter and then of course we have thermal pollution where we just have heated water being dumped into another body of water additionally we have invasive species um, they have various effects they can ha alter habitat uh, they can compete 
with native species. They can prey on native species. And they have socio-economic uh, impacts, like on our fishing industry. Um, or if you have a, a water treatment plant, or I should say a water treatment facility for drinking water, and you're pulling water out of a river or a lake that has uh, zebra mussels, that can create increased costs and um, lower reliability of the water source without investing a lot to control So what are the it. invasives that you are showing? This is a round goby. It's not in Vermont. It's in the Great Lakes. It's one we want to keep out of here. This one here is a zebra mussel, which we do have in Lake Champlain. This is the footfish hook shrimp. Um, it's new. Um, found its way into Lake Champlain. Uh, this is um, uh, one of the Asian carps, which you've probably seen YouTube videos out in the Mississippi or some of the tributaries where motorboats going by and these things are leaping out of the water and slamming people in the face and that sort of thing. We don't have them here uh, and we don't want them. And this is kind of uh, cropped off, but that's sea lamprey. Loss of biological diversity, and this is broad. It goes beyond fish, but focus here is on fish. And things that I've touched upon is the loss of biological diversity means a loss of species, a loss of populations, communities and community structure, and genetic diversity. All of that stuff um, is a threat to our populations. And Climate change. Again, habitat alterations, species range shifts. It's predicted that with climate change and warming of particularly New England that we are going to see a retraction of the range of our native brook trout um, further to the north. And we may see an expansion of the range of certain warm water fish, such as bass, into places that are now supporting native brook trout populations. So there are changes. If you watch your, you know, feed your birds, you're noticing changes at your bird feeder. Mm -hmm. Where 20, 30 years ago, cardinals or Carolina wrens or titmice and that sort of thing were, you know, unusual, if not rare, um, they're regulars now. So we are seeing these rain shifts occurring. Uh, accelerated, <coughs> accelerated rates of species extension, extinctions we could see. And again, here, the socioeconomic impacts that go along with that. Did you go back to, what kind of shrimp was that? Fish hook. Fish hook? Yeah, it's got a little organ on there that it can attach to nets, fishing line, and stuff like that. And it builds up. Each one of those little, if you can see the eyes, the little black dots, there's a, there's a mass of these organisms on that fishing line. Are they the same as slimy No, no. Are they edible? No. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then I mentioned about you know, when I went into this, it was meant for, you know, at least part of the audience would be a conservation commission or a planning commission. And I, I, I gave some thought as to what would be the five community-based conservation strategies that can be adopted at the town level. And one is include specific language in the town plan supporting the stewardship, protection, and restoration of riparian habitat. It's not just about the stream. Incorporate development setbacks and buffers from surface waters into town zoning ordinances. Again, the emphasis here is on riparian habitat. Adopt town road management standards designed to protect water quality, riparian habitat, and associated streams and wetlands. This all in also includes culverts. But there's the Better Back Roads program, which talks about 
um, designing roads and maintaining roads so you're not getting as much sediment coming off of road mm. surfaces in our, into our streams. Replace problem road crossings with fish friendly structures, which I went over, uh, passable culverts and bridges, and balance flood resiliency measures with the habitat requirements of stream and riparian biota. It's a mouthful, but basically is after Tropical Storm Irene, a lot of activity was done that did, from a biological point of view, probably did more damage to our streams than the actual flood did. If you think of our fish populations, Irene, you know, those species have seen those events for thousands of years, and they get knocked back, but they are able to overcome it and thrive. And in fact, those events oftentimes kind of uh, give a kickstart to habitat that's been kind of stagnant and unchanged, and it brings in more wood, it cleans out sediment out of the substrate, it kind of does a good house cleaning, so to speak. And populations respond positively to that. Same thing with your garden. If you had a garden and you never, you know, rototilled it or, or turned the soil, that sort of thing, it becomes pretty unproductive place. Well, a stream sort of is the same thing. It needs those natural events to disturb it and to kind of give it a new kickstart. And populations respond to it. But like that channel eye section, it's going to be a long time for that to recover. And you could go in there and you could spend money to restore it. But that's a lot of money, and we had a lot of miles of stream in Vermont that were damaged as a result of some of the activity that was done. Now, some of it had to be done, but um, that's what I say. You have to, you know, think wisely about what you're doing to recover from a flood or make something, um, you know, inc improve your... Um, resistance to flood damage, but at the same time, don't do it totally at the expense of the, the habitat and the streams. And I think that's it. Thank you. Yes. If, if not quite off topic, but uh, the uh, you know the Vernon Dam Dam creates a, an enormous slack water, you know, all, all the way up to Bellas Falls, essentially. And uh, thinking blue sky, uh, what do you think would be the positive impacts of removing the, Ver the Vernon Dam? Well, ecologically, yes, <laughs> yes. Ecologically, the river would be better off without, you know, having that. Uh -huh. But there things? would be, the, well, the dam. It is a because you're not getting moving water, it, mm -hmm. it, it does act as a heat sink. Right, right. So it, it would cool up. the river. The river would be expected to be somewhat cooler without oh. the dam. Um, it also captures a lot of sediment. It, because of its existence, all of those species, those non-native species that were injured, introduced to the river, if it was free-flowing, a lot of those species wouldn't have found the habitat suitable to take a hold oh. anyway. Oh, so I guess it depends what your sure. your interest is. If you're interested in northern pike, you might like the dam and the impoundment. But um, other species that are migratory, um, you know, the power companies have had to build fish ladders and that sort of thing and downstream fish passage, which comes at a, you know, mm -hmm. a cost. So it's more complicated. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, earlier when you showed the uh, species of native and non-native, you had the uh, shiners and the dace. Are those the only ones that the state manages that they allow, like, bait stores to sell sports fishermen? Some of those species that were on that... Um, well, how do you know what I mean? How does yeah. that play into the... the... The restrictions on bait fish species has two purposes. 
One is there's had been the long the uh, the long practice of taking bait fish minnows and shiners out of one body of water mm -hmm. and moving them to another body of water. And we have increasing number of exotic diseases that are coming into the country mm -hmm. into the country now. And when you take fish and introduce them to a particular or take them from a body of water without knowing the disease history of that water and you remove them move them to another body of water you're transporting the disease. The other thing is you, you're, you may also be transporting fish that are found in one body of water. It doesn't occur into another water, and you bring them and you're done with your bait and you dump them down, you know, down the, the ice hole. And now you've increased or you've added another species to that fish community that can be detrimental. I know, I understand that, but what I'm saying is, are those species that we're looking at, are those the only ones that the state will allow them to sell, or could there be a whole different species? You those, those species that um, you see on the list are all, all native species, or they may be native in one part of the state and not another, but are, have been widely distributed already, um, such as fathead minnow. Um, those are legal. The bait shops, they have to get their fish from a certified disease-free source. And it, you can go into Pond X and you could, if it had uh, creek chubs in there, you could capture creek chubs and use them for bait in Pond X. You're not allowed to take those fish and move them to Pond Y. Um, but because of the bait shops, they used to, it used to be the time where they'd go up in Lake Champlain and net wild fish, bring them into their shops, and then sell them all over the state. Well, there's a, you're, that's a vector for spreading disease as well as a vector for spreading unwanted fish. Um, so now they have to, they could use creek chubs, um, black nose dace, long nose dace, but from the commercial sources, they the commercial sources only produce two di two species that are permissible in the state: golden shiners and fathead minnows. So there aren't the other sources. You'd have to use them wild, right? And you'd have to you you're restricted to use them in the water that you catch them. Somebody else? I have a question about. Oh, yes. And then. About culverts and yes. the, the drop, and <clears throat> what's, a, what's an excessive drop for a fish that's trying to go up or downstream? There's a rough rule of thumb, and it, it varies on the bait, on the size of the fish. But if you have a drop, your culvert, and you have, a say, a brook trout, you have, we'll say there's several inches, maybe maybe a half a foot, if you've got good water coming in, and the and the, the pitch of the culvert is not too steep. If it's, say, it's level, and it's about six inches above, you have to have a plunge pool below there that's a, one and a half times the height that it has to jump. So if it's six, if the jump is six inches and the water below where the water's enter, you know, coming out of the culvert is six inches, it's probably not going to make it. It needs one and a half times the depth. So six <coughs> inches and you're going to need nine inches of water. Did I get that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Six inches. Yep. Yeah, nine inches of water below there. What happens is that water, as it comes down and hits, it comes down and it creates a kind of a back wash and the fish use that as a springboard. They utilize, they come up there and that water that's coming down and kicking up, they'll use that and up. Now that doesn't mean it's going to successfully get through the culvert. It has to be level, um, there's another, but just to get into there. 
those are some of the conditions you have. Now, you could have a, uh, um, a high culvert, big drop, and one and a half times deep. Six inch brook trout isn't going to make it, you know. So that's why I said there's a fish size in there. Maybe a large rainbow might be able to get in there, but not a brook trout. So there's some size limits. Yes? How successful have these fish ladders been? And did that, do they, have, these dams have that big of an influence on our Atlantic salmon population not returning? Or? Well, Atlantic salmon specifically, there were a number of factors in, that were working against it. Um, the, the ladders that were built at the dams, the salmon used those without a problem. Mm -hmm. um, shad are a little bit more finicky, um, so it takes more t tinkering around with the ladders to get them so they're acceptable to, um, or to be effective with shad. But other species of fish, walleye, we see smallmouth bass going through the ladders. The ladders work well. I guess if you're going to have a dam, then the ladder's the best option. But ladders are expensive. They are, um, require a lot of maintenance. It's not something you just turn on and walk away from. They require daily monitoring. And if you get like small fish ladders, um, you get leaves in the fall coming down and all of that, um, sticks. All that stuff has to clear it out of there. So, you know, it... <laughs> It's a tool to overcome something that there isn't another solution to. Would be better not to have the dam. <laughs> okay? Yeah. At the very beginning, you had uh, showed the maps, uh, and all the brooks were blue in, yeah. in the demo. Did, did I download that, those maps like that, you know, showing all the little feeder brooks? Uh, I could it, send it, you... A place where I could, you know... Well, I, 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 had I, to create, to... I had to create that for oh, the show. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> So All right. um, I don't have a, you know, like a... There isn't a website or a, no. a, a thing you click on and it no. shows up You can go the to um, the Vermont Agency site and there's the Natural Resource Atlas. I'll have to write that down a little later. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's really easy to use mm -hmm. and you can click on the streams and it will click on all the blue lights oh. like that. I mean, uh, blue streams on it. Yeah. The Natural Resource Atlas. Uh, it would be at the Vermont Natural uh, Agency of Natural Resources public website. It's a it's a mapping tool. I understand what it is. Yeah. I just want to know where to go to get it. Oh, um, what's the URL? What's the, what's, what's the I, off the top of my head, I don't know. <laughs> if there was a natural resource atlas. Yeah. 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 If you Google it, it will come up. Search. Yeah. Oh, was there someone else or any other questions? Okay. One more. What's the advantage of a box culvert? In yeah. some, they're, they're easier to construct or to, to put into place. Um, if you put in one of those arches, like you have to build the footings to attach that to, so it's a more complicated construction where if you have the box culvert, you don't have to have footings. You just have to excavate, drop the box in there at the right elevations, and backfill it. Cheaper and easier. It's, yeah, it's, it's quicker but, and but cheaper. Almost as good. Yeah, yeah, if they're, if they're put in the right, you know, in the right way. Um, I mean, you may get in situations where, say, just below the substrate, you have a uh, ledge. So you're not going to be able to put in a box because it has to go down deep. So putting in an arch may be the best thing and using the ledge as a footing.
Great. Thanks, Ken, very You're much. You're welcome. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you. You're all coming out. Um, this program will be available on BCTV. You can go to our website, um, dummerstonconservation.com, and um, uh, there's, there'll be a link there. All of our programs um, are archived on BCTV, and they're available to anybody who wants to see it. And if uh, you'd like to contribute on your way out uh, to help us um, pay for the expenses of things like that, we would appreciate it. And hope to see you in two weeks at the Thank you.